we're so pleased to be here this morning, and I'm particularly honored uh, to share the stage uh, with Governor Patrick this morning. Um, it's been an exciting week for those of us who work in impact investing. Um, Will already mentioned uh, in his welcome that the Business Roundtable, over 200 CEOs, came together on Monday to talk about uh, really stepping away from shareholder primacy um, and really thinking about all of the very important stakeholders in the work of investing in companies. And so this morning, uh, we're here to talk about impact at scale and impact investing. Uh, there are more than 2,000 of you gathered for this week's conference. And so far, you've talked about topics as wide-ranging as human side of big data, quantum computing. But I want to start our conversation this morning um, talking about why technology is not the answer to all of the problems that we face today in the economy. How do you believe that impact investing will help solve some of our big systematic and systemic challenges in today's economy? Wow, there are a lot of questions in that question. <laughs> I, well, first of all, I think um, as, a, as someone who has worked in business, in government, in not-for-profits, one of the observations from, from that range of uh, experience has been for me that, you know, business has done what it's done and then government and, uh, and not-for-profits have been around to kind of pick up the pieces. And I think the challenges facing us as, a, uh, as humankind are of such scale and complexity that we really need everybody doing what they can uh, to contribute to solutions. So I'm not one of the people who thinks that impact investing, and I will define what we mean by that in just a second, um, is the answer, or frankly, that, that private enterprise is the answer. But I think all sectors and all of us have to be part of how we, um, how we make a livable um, and more just world. Um, what we do is uh, try to identify uh, companies, not startups, so we're a later stage investor, where there is a mission-oriented entrepreneur um, uh, who is looking to scale and needs capital to do that and wants a like-minded partner mm. to help them do so. And we've, um, we're, we're uh, uh, we are underwriting to the same standards as the large cap funded bank capital. Um, so it's a competitive uh, private equity rate of return and measurable impact in three areas, which we describe as health and wellness, uh, sustainability, and education and workforce um, development. And I come to that, and it sort of brings me to the, where you started with the statement from the uh, business roundtable, that, um, you know, in a, to me, especially at a time of ubiquitous information, mm -hmm. it's not really possible to manage to a financial bottom line alone. Because frankly, if you mess up you know, on the planet or people, those bottom lines will come around to bite your financial bottom line today. It's not a big step from there, in my mind, to impact investing, which is about being intentional about those other bottom lines. So if you really believe in long-term value, I think you have to think about all the stakeholders. And that's, I think, the significance of what we heard from the Business Roundtable. What they do is another story, and how they do it, particularly in, in public settings, with the pressure to report quarterly um, uh, financial uh, uh, results uh, remains to be seen. Yeah. So, so I'm going to follow up a little bit here, because I, I think it's easy for us to say, well, all stakeholders are important. But in impact investing, which to me is a shorthand way of talking about outcomes, about short-term, medium-term, long-term outcomes, what are the real outcomes that we should be seeking through investment, right? Because investment is just one tool, but arguably a very critical tool to the economy. And so what outcomes should we be seeking in a world where Sao Paulo looks like night right. during the day, right? right? right. Where uh, Greenland is at risk of sinking, yes. right? What, what are the outcomes that we should be seeking 
through investment as a tool and as a vehicle? So I, th I think the question is important and impossible for me to answer. Um, and I'll, I'll just say, in a, from a practical perspective, because of the, the, um, the outcomes that you alluded to in terms of how the climate is changing and the, th and the risk to humankind, um, uh, you know, over what used to be the long term and now is more and more the medium term, that is absolutely critical. Um, so is um, chronic poverty. So is a, uh, a lack of access to affordable and, uh, and, and high quality health care. By the way, I'm not leaving out the fact that all of this is interconnected. Um, but one of the things I found when we were um, trying to figure out what we wanted this new fund to be. This is the first new business at Bain Capital in a, in a dozen years. Mm. And um, so, you know, we were writing on a blank sheet of paper mm. and trying to sort out where um, the white space was for the kind of uh, capabilities that the firm had <clears throat> and, and where my own interests um, uh, lay. We did not, and I didn't want to focus on just one kind of impact. And when we were out, um, and, but we did narrow, I mean, even in those, within those broad uh, thematic verticals I described, um, where th there are some things we left out um, mm -hmm. that are, are very meaningful. We did find that there were investors, some of whom said, you know, my thing is uh, climate change, and I just want to invest in that. Or uh, others said, you know, my thing is um, impact in a certain region of the country, and we just want to invest for that. You know, you can't say that doesn't count. That's important. You want to encourage uh, the kind of uh, uh, long-term thinking that those investors bring to those um, issues. So I'm careful about um, uh, implying that our choices represent values choices among what is and is not worthy impact. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is demonstrate at scale that you don't have to trade. You may choose to, mm -hmm. but you don't have to trade return for impact. And I think as we do that at, at scale, it raises some very important questions that uh, regular way investors can't avoid uh, about, the about the full consequences of the investment decisions that, uh, that uh, they and we make. And, and when we talk about impact at scale, what, what do you think that, that it looks like when we succeed, right? What is true? impact at scale. Both of those words are very, I think they can be quite fuzzy words, they right? Are. Impact, scale. P purposefully, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah. I, mean, I think quite intentionally. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think at scale, so, so you know, there, again, back to the point that there are different audiences mm -hmm. um, that, uh, uh, that we're trying to reach. There are obviously our LPs, but there, there, there is a wider audience of, uh, of private equity, of venture, venture capital, and how they think about um, what um, success looks like. I think more and more, by the way, there are decisions that we as consumers, as citizens, are making about how we live and what we eat and what we wear and where it comes from and, uh, and so on. All of that is creating markets and, and that's, uh, and that's uh, uh, driving entrepreneurs to create companies that are responsive to those uh, markets. And what we're trying to show is that there is value from a you know, strictly kind of uh, financial um, uh, perspective uh, even, um, that is not our objective solely or even mainly, but we're trying to show that it's a false trade to say that you can't invest in companies that are actually trying to make our world better and, uh, uh, and and trade off your return. In fact, there may be a premium to be harvested for in investing in those kinds of companies. I'll give an example of what I'm talking about. Um, we, um, in, the, in our health and wellness vertical, we were very interested in, in pediatric um, uh, uh, oral hygiene. Lots and lots of studies that show uh, that overall health and wellness, and, and actually even uh, academic uh, 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 outcomes, can be affected by um, poor pediatric um, uh, health care. And I learned a lot about this in my old job during the recession. We were having to make all these, uh, all these cuts, and we were getting into the question about uh, health care for poor people and, uh, and where, the, um, where the cuts uh, should land, if at all, in that space, a big part of our budget in Massachusetts, and, um, uh, and the question of uh, 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 dental care for kids 
came up. Anyhow, so we, these DSOs, they're called, dental, dental services organizations, it's a thing out there, a bunch of chains of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of, uh, of dentists. And, um, and there, a lot of them were on the market, and we saw a couple we got interested in, and we found one um, actually here in California, mm -hmm. mostly focused on private pay, but we thought, okay, they're on the market, they're for sale, maybe this is one we can direct toward serving uh, 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 kids who don't have access. And we were well down the road in the, in the uh, diligence, and one, of the, and one of the executives said, you know, look, the company's for sale, we get that, we hope you're the buyer, but if this is your strategy, we quit when, you, when it's, uh, when it's uh, closed. We said, eh, maybe you're not the team for us. Mm. We kept looking, and we found a company in uh, Texas, um, 20 different 20 um, offices at this point and growing. And their whole model is built on the Medicaid population. Hmm. Very profitable, very forward-leaning, um, and very focused on how to reach kids who don't get um, reached and measuring that outcome uh, over time. That's the sort of company um, that might be able to attract capital anyhow from the regular market because they're growing and they're profitable but they wanted a particular kind of capital partner that was interested in scaling all of what they're trying to do, not just their financial bottom lines. A company called Rodeo Dental, go check them out. Um, very well, exciting. So I think it's, it's very interesting that you gave as an example a growth company. Um, you know, not necessarily a new economy business, but a business that will be profitable, profitable with a purpose. And, and I suspect there are people in the audience who are actually skeptics of impact investing. Um, and we have folks from all over the world. And one of the arguments that you frequently hear outside of the US against impact investing is, uh, aren't these responsibilities of the government and, and as a former uh, elected uh, official, what are your views on why should we expect the private sector to step in when serving the common good is arguably a responsibility of the government and of the nonprofit social sector? Well, it's everyone's responsibility. Mm. I mean, that's why it's, com it's, that's why it's the common good and the, and the difference today is, um, and I, I want to be clear, I'm not one of these folks who says, you know, and I meet these folks in the impact investing conferences and other settings who say, you know, we're from the private sector, we'll take it from here. I'm not that. Mm. You know, government has um, an incredibly important role to play. It doesn't always play it everywhere, but it has a role to play. Uh, the social sector has a role to play. Um, by the way, there's a range, even in impact investing, of, of views on where you ought to land on the returns spectrum, right? And concessionary returns are perfectly right. Um, we chose where we did on that, on that spectrum, not as a value judgment about where other, others are, but because we wanted to show at scale, as I said, um, that, that it was a, it's a false choice to have to trade return for impact and, and because of the kinds of investors who invest in the kinds of uh, funds that Bain Capital uh, offers expect a, uh, a uh, competitive rate of, uh, of return. Yeah. So, you know, th most of our challenges, uh, and I say our challenges as uh, humankind, uh, our common interests require everybody thinking about and focused on how to make things better. And I don't think any sector should be off the hook. And I think one of the great things about impact investing is that uh, it's a way for private industry to begin to think about how, uh, about its responsibility um, beyond the financial bottom line. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I think profit for purpose is, is not an oxymoron. Um, and so I know that. I, mean, I know what you do. So I was <laughs> surprised to hear that question come from you. <laughs> well, it was a little bit of being a devil's advocate. Okay. Um, so I, I feel like I'd be remiss to, to have a politician on the stage and not ask a political question. Um, you, you famously traded your public sector hat for a role at one of the most competitive, most capitalist firms in the world. Uh, 
Is there anything that gives you hope about the current global uh, political climate? Anything? Anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so first a of glimmer, all, a glimmer. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be hopeful about. But you, you know, my grandmother used to say, "Hope for the best and work for it." Mm -hmm. um, you know, you 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 have to you have to contribute. I mean, I'm I'm a Democrat. I'm not the sort of Democrat who thinks you have to you have to hate Republicans to be a good Democrat. Um, and I am excited about the depth and breadth of talent in the in the field in the Democratic field for. Uh, uh, for president. I'm excited about um, the numbers of new members of Congress, many of them never candidates before yeah. who, stepped, uh, who stepped forward. And I'm excited about the, um, about the numbers of citizens who are seeing themselves again as citizens mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and recognizing that in a democracy we get the government we deserve. Mm -hmm. And if you want better, you've got you to gotta participate, you've got to get involved. So I am not um, uh, I am not a, uh, I'm worried about the incumbent administration. Um, but as we were saying backstage, the one truth that candidate Trump spoke in 2016, in my view, was when he said that conventional establishment politics wasn't working very well for most people. And that is true. And it's the same thing that uh, Senator Sanders was saying the cycle before. It's the same thing that Barack Obama said a decade and a half before. And it is still true. So I think that if we, um, if we are about more than just trying to, you know, get things back to the way they were, but thinking bigger ab uh, about how uh, big and innovative solutions can be part of government, which is a place where politics punishes failure, mm -hmm. and yet failure is necessary as an environmental matter to have innovation, mm -hmm. um, then I think, uh, I think there's a lot to be hopeful about. Yeah. I, I know that you also believe that, that there is, is hope in the current uh, global environment where there's been a lot of divisiveness, mm. um, but that, that there is an opportunity to be hopeful about our shared humanity uh, versus our differences. And, uh, we, we have folks here who uh, have come from some from near, but mostly from far. Um, and, and what are your views on how we collectively move forward in the U.S. and, and also as a global community? Wow. Do we have time for this? Um, I think we have a couple more minutes, yes. <laughs> well, I guess I, you know, I, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Um, most of that time on welfare, my mother and sister and I lived in our grandparents' two-bedroom tenement with various relatives who came and went. My mother and sister and I shared one of those bedrooms and a set of bunk beds. So you go from the top bunk to the bottom bunk to the floor every third night on the floor. <laughs> you know, my, my, my public schools were big and, uh, and overcrowded and under-resourced and sometimes violent, but I had adults uh, in those schools and in that neighborhood who treated us like we were theirs. Mm. Um, that, and, and who taught us that membership in a community is about seeing your stake in your neighbor's dreams and struggles as well as your own. Mm. I've had opportunities to work in a lot of different sectors and in a lot of parts of the world. And some of the challenges that I remember from growing up in Chicago, the steel mills leaving and mm. the devastation and uncertainty that that created economically in the community, the presence of opioid addiction in the neighborhood, in our home for that matter, the, 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 the brokenness of, the, uh, of policing and, and, and the criminal justice system and how that affected us. I see those experiences being shared much more broadly today mm than they once were. And we could spend our time, and sometimes I do, wondering why it is it takes certain issues reaching certain other communities before they count as an issue. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there's another opportunity to see these as common experiences that require a common solution, mm -hmm. and that we all have a stake in, in, those, uh, in those solutions. So I feel like that moment is here, and I'm looking for, um, 
uh, and trying to encourage and trying to reflect a kind of leadership that says you can see that common stake um, and, uh, and a common uh, a solution. And I think there are other uh, uh, leaders and followers um, working toward the same, same ends. So I want to pose one more question before we move to, uh, to your closing thoughts. Um, and it's about career path. Um, and in a recent interview, you talked about having been on like a zigzag path in your career. And you know, one of the things that Singularity University is doing is helping people on their path. And many are on that same kind of zigzag approach to career. You've been in government service in the nonprofit sector, now in the for-profit sector. Um, what, what advice do you have for folks about broadening their experiences beyond their comfort zone, right? I think that wow. that's a big part of the challenge is how do you move beyond that comfort zone? So when I graduated from college, the first of my family to graduate, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Mm. I thought about law school. I thought about business school. I applied to the good, seminary. Good thing you didn't do that. I mean, you <laughs> see, I was all over the place. <laughs> yeah. And I, w I was rescued from my indecision by a uh, traveling fellowship called the Rockefeller Fellowship mm. that required you spend a year in a non-Western culture. Mm. And they gave you enough money to get there and get back. Um, and that was it, so that you wouldn't be tempted to kind of move into the local intercontinental hotel <laughs> and wait out the year. And I wanted to go to Africa. I never traveled outside the United States before. Um, I wrote to everybody I knew who knew somebody in Africa. And I got a response from one person, just one letter back, um, who worked on a project in Khartoum, Sudan. Mm. And he said, I know what you're trying to do. Get here and we'll figure, out, uh, figure it out when you get here. So I got there. Um, you know, I got myself a backpack and filled it. We don't do this on South Side <laughs> Chicago, but I got a backpack filled it up with my stuff, and I flew from, I remember flying from Athens to Cairo and teaching myself the numbers and the greetings in Arabic during the flight. Mm. And then um, after a little while in Cairo, I hitchhiked to, to Khartoum, which is about 1,200 miles on every kind of conveyance. And I found my way to the office of the guy I'd been writing to, and I learned when I arrived there that he had left the week before for two years in Long Beach, California. Oh and had said, <laughs> had said nothing to his office about my coming or what I was supposed to do. And, um, uh, you know, there I was. And I had to, uh, I, you know, eventually talk my way onto the project. To get rid of me, they sent me to Darfur, which was another 600 uh -huh. miles across the desert. It was very different then than it is now. Um, but there was no mail, no phone service, um, mm -hmm. no way to communicate for months. But I figured it out. Right. I learned the language, I learned how to make friends, I learned how to feed myself, I learned how to do the job. And I think when you are in a setting where you, where you figure out how to figure it out, mm -hmm. it changes everything, everything. Your willingness to take calculated risks is, I mean, I'd never run for anything before I ran for governor. You could have gone a different way, very much could have gone a different way. Um, but. Um, and I, I think the best thing we did when I, was, when I was governor was persuade the citizens of Massachusetts to think bigger mm. about their own capabilities to address our long-term uh, challenges. And I think we have a pretty good record um, in having, having done that. So I, it's, I guess my, my advice is get outside your comfort zone. You probably have more capability than you think. But it's, a, it's probably an unnecessary message for the folks who associate with Singularity U University. Yeah. Well, I uh, do want to give you an opportunity to share any final thoughts and comments. Um, I also want to thank the audience for being so uh, attentive. And uh, on this third day, on this last final day of your conference, uh, I know it's been my pleasure to uh, sit with you and chat for 30 minutes. Um, and with that, I would invite you to have the final word today. Oh, gracious. Well, um, I want to thank you too, Lisa, for, uh, uh, for moderating this and for, um, for your thoughtful questions. And thanks, everybody, for having me. I know it's the last day and folks are, uh, 
uh, are recovering from the uh, um, from the fire hose of uh, great presenters and uh, and thinkers. I, I I would just say this. I think um, certainly in the United States, um, uh, and I think it's increasingly true. If it hasn't always been true around the world, we're pretty good at innovation um, historically. We're less good at transition, mm. which is to say we we're pretty good at inventing the future but we're um, less intentional about how we help people um, seize those opportunities, prepare for those uh, opportunities, and, uh, and ride that future together. And this is a time, I think, when um, it would behoove us to be a lot more intentional about bringing everybody um, forward and leaving fewer people behind and leaving it to others to figure out how, if at all, to pick up those uh, pieces. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.